All right, all right. What's going on, everybody? We are back. It is Thursday, March 19th, and we are back for Haitian History 101 live. This is Franz Renicourt Jr. Uh, we're going to get started in about 10 minutes uh, for today's session, which is going to be awesome. And uh, thank you, everyone, for registering, RSVPing, joining us. Uh, of course, we're all under uh current circumstances with what's going on with uh the world today so just trying to figure out different ways to you know keep spreading knowledge keep spreading you know information on our amazing history you know haitian history is a passion of mine for sure so uh we have great stories a lot of stories we can learn from so you know it's part of my mission to share these stories of our ancestors and their struggle for freedom and independence. So just thought this would be a great way to connect with everybody. Also, you know, I know a lot of our kids are uh, home, you know, schools are closed. So this is a great way to get your kids some education on something that they're not gonna learn in school. I mean, I mean, a lot of this stuff, they don't even teach in schools in Haiti, you know, that uh, the topics that we're talking about. So just something to add, you know, especially if you're, um, you know, uh, of Haitian descent, but even not, you know, I mean, Haitian history is world history, you know, not even black history, it's world history. Things that happened in Haiti had worldwide consequences and um, uh, in regards to a lot of different things, economy, world economy, slavery, you know, all that stuff, Haiti was, Haiti's history um is very important to learn from so you're gonna get started in just a few it's about 12 53 right now you get started like around uh 1 p.m all right uh let's see All right, okay, looks like our meeting room is starting to fill up a little bit. Let's see who's in. All right, Fancy, what up? Homegirl Fancy is in the building. Uh, let's see, oh, you know what I need to do? I need to share, I need to share the links from the last, pre the, the previous programs. All right, so of course today's Thursday, we've been doing this all week. Uh, so we started on Monday. All right, I'm about to switch screens for a minute, guys. Uh, let's see, I gotta grab something. Come on, come on, come on. I swear, man, I'm, I'm so low tech. Uh, let's see. Starting to get used to this Zoom thing, or trying to get used to it, I should say. Uh, all right, I'll just do it later. But I pretty much I loaded the previous programs on uh, YouTube. So we started on Monday, where we talked about the um, the Arawak Kingdom, the, the Taínos, and the Spanish invasion. Uh, that was a great program. However, I failed to record that program. So we did that whole program and it wasn't recorded. So that's the only one that we don't have recorded. Uh, 
And then on Tuesday, we talked about uh, the French and slavery and the revolutions, uh, the Haitian Revolution and the French Revolution. Uh, that was a cool program. Um, we also talked about independence on Tuesday as well. And then yesterday, Wednesday, we focused on post-1804, right? So a lot of times we talk about, you know, 1804, 1804, but, you know, we always, you know, kind of stop right there. But so much happened in that 25-year period between 1804 and um, sort of like, uh, like 1825, 1830. So we covered a lot that happened in there with the uh, uh, Dessalines Empire, Chris, Christos Kingdom, and, um, you know, Pétion and the, the Republic of Haiti. So that, so the last two, uh, Tuesday's program and Wednesday's program, uh, were recorded and the links are on uh, YouTube. <clears throat> so I'm going to share those links um, uh, probably after the program or Fancy, Fancy did a great job of sharing those links in the chat room. If you could do that again, that'd be awesome. Uh, and then today we're going to get into the US invasion of Haiti. So that's gonna be pretty cool. So I'll just give you guys a quick heads up, everybody that's on uh, online right now. I did a pretty detailed uh, presentation on the U.S. invasion of Haiti uh, a couple of years ago, right? And um, I was able to find that presentation video. Uh, I actually did the presentation for the Haitian American uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce in Atlanta. They were doing a Haitian history series. And they asked me to do a few series. I did two. And uh, one of them was the US occupation of Haiti um, between 1915 and 1934. So I found that video. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna play that video this afternoon. So we're gonna be, we're still gonna be live. Uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna, Dave is gonna join us and we're gonna talk about different parts of the video, uh, like, when we need to, uh, we could pause the video and talk about it, you know, what I just said and stuff. But it's a very uh, detailed account of the US occupation, like leading up to it and um, a little bit after it as well. So I think you guys are gonna enjoy it. Uh, just went, uh, I watched it last night. Uh, well, actually it was like early this morning and it was pretty good. So uh, I'm gonna play that video and then we're gonna talk about it afterwards. So. Um, the way we work, if it's your first time here uh, on this webinar series, we're going to take questions at the end. So all the questions as this is going on, uh, you could put in the chat room. So what we're going to do, we're going to open up the chat room. But as the presentation is going on, just type your questions up in the chat room. And then we're going to get to it at the end of the presentation. All right, where's my partner in crime? There he is. All right, just feel free to unmute yourself, Dave, once you're ready. Yes, sir. All right, I can hear you. You can hear me? Yes, sir. All right, cool, cool. So, uh, yeah, so like I said, um, I have the video queued up, ready to go. And, um, you know, whenever you want to chime in, just, you know, go ahead and say, yo, you know, uh, you want to add something to, to what was said in the video and then I could pause the video and then we could talk uh, about it. Sound good? Yeah, I think, well, since it's a video, I think it might be best to just let it play out and then, um, you know, add comments afterwards and the folks have questions to uh, answer. All right, that sounds good too. You know, we just let it run. Um, just, but just, you know, be sure everybody to, you know, get your questions in the chat room. Uh, you know, so that way at the end of the video, the video is probably like about, uh, I don't remember how long it was. It was like 45 minutes, 50 minutes, something like that. And, um, you know, at the end, we could go back and I answer all the questions. All right, so it's 1 p.m. I wanna go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna first do our introduction that we, that we usually do. 
at the beginning of these programs. So this is Haitian History 101 live. I just wanted to put something like this together for everyone. Of course, a lot of us are, you know, pretty much stuck at home. Um, you, you know, I'm, I've been at home. I, I've only go out when I'm, it's absolutely necessary. Uh, I went out this morning a little bit to, to the grocery store to get some food, stock up, you know, a little bit more stuff in the fridge. The kids are eating everything in sight. So um, it seems like I have to go to the grocery store a little bit more often, but I'm about to put the food on, on lock in the house. <laughs> so, um, so I just want to do something to, you know, continue to share the information. Haitian history is a passion of mine. Uh, originally, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Both I'm a first generation Haitian American. So both my parents were born and raised in Haiti. And, uh, you know, pretty much went throughout my entire educational uh, life here in the United States without knowing a lot of this stuff. So a lot of the things that I talk about is uh, self-taught, you know, from reading books, going to Haiti, asking a bunch of questions from different scholars. So, uh, and just being curious, right? So I came up with a lot of this information and, uh, and what I realized is a lot of people are not familiar with this information. So I ended up writing a couple of books, like children's type books with illustrations, but uh, you know, the books are doing pretty well, right? So they're selling. So right now I published four books. The last book I published uh, was with uh, Professor Bayina Bello. A lot of you may be in, um, have heard of and uh, called Shiro's of the Haitian Revolution. So that's been going well. And I've just been, you know, selling my books. I'm also an entrepreneur. I have real estate investments and, you know, I do a whole bunch of different things. So, uh, so that's a little bit about me. And uh, the schedule, uh, like I said earlier, uh, we started on Monday. We talked about the Arawaks and the Spanish invasion. Tuesday, we talked about slavery, revolution and independence. Wednesday, which was yesterday, that was a cool program. We talked about the empire of Dessalines, the King Henry's kingdom and uh, the Republic of Haiti. And today we have the US invasion of Haiti. Tomorrow, we're gonna go into dictatorship and democracy. So if you guys are enjoying these videos, it looks like we're gonna be under lock on lockdown for a while. <laughs> because I know I'm not gonna be able, all, all of my events pretty much um, that's coming up in May, are, are pretty much postponed or canceled. So I'm probably gonna continue doing these webinar series uh, in different type of formats, maybe not Haitian History 101, but you know, featuring, a, you know, maybe doing something else like this. So if you guys are interested in you know, doing more of this, this type of thing, just let me know in the chat room, All right? So again, I don't do this on my own. I'm honored to have you know, a great co-host, a, a, a great friend of mine, someone I call my brother, I met years ago here in Washington, D.C. And uh, he's joining us now, my boy Dave. Dave, you there? Yes, sir. Uh, you guys uh, directly from Haiti. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to uh, be with you guys to do this uh, with France. Um, France and I, as I mentioned before, we met uh, a couple of years ago when I was working at the Haitian Embassy in Washington, uh, serving as Director of Culture and Education internationally, given the work out front, uh, was, um, it was natural for us to collaborate and to uh, become friends. So, uh, pleasure to be joining you guys uh, from Haiti. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, so we're going to pretty much be the hosts, you know, um, of the program today. And uh, so we're going to go ahead and I think we're going to get started. All right, so Haitian History 101, the U.S. occupation of Haiti. So like I said, I did a, a pretty detailed presentation on the U.S. occupation of Haiti a couple of years ago um, as a webinar. So I'm going to play that video, right? And um, it goes through a lot of detail. It's the same type of format, presentation format uh, with a slideshow. So I'm going to go ahead and start playing that now and then... Um, and then we could talk about it. All right, guys, let's see what we got here. Okay, so real quick, let me set this up. Uh, in the first couple of minutes, um, I messed up the presentation. I thought the screen was what my screen was showing, but obviously it wasn't, it was showing this. So maybe about two minutes in, 
the screen is going to change back to the slideshow. So, um, but I, t I, keep, I start talking in the beginning, so I want you guys to hear what I'm saying. So don't be alarmed if you see all what's on your screen right now. It's going to change like about two, two minutes in. All right, guys, here we go. gospel of Haitian history as you are friends and as the chamber is so welcome to your webinar friends the floor is yours I will leave it to you to run with it now all right fantastic thank you Sorrel I appreciate the introduction and thank you everyone for joining this uh, webinar this evening uh, I'm gonna try to keep this very uh, informational for everyone and um, hopefully everyone enjoys what I'm about to share uh, this evening. Um, as a little bit for me before I get started, just so that you know where I come from, I'm actually a first generation Haitian American. So both of my parents were born in Haiti and I was born here in the US in Brooklyn, New York to be exact. So, um, but a funny thing happened with me, uh, I didn't learn any Haitian history from my parents. Most of the Haitian history that I've learned was self-taught. Um, also, I mean, my parents, I can't really blame them for not telling me about the revolution and, you know, independence and stuff like that because they were very uh, busy. You know, they were hard workers, um, had four kids, and they had to provide food, put food on the table, stuff like that. So uh, they sent us to very good schools and they expected those schools to deal with our education. Um, but the funny thing was that you rarely hear Haiti come up in schools here in the United States, especially back in the 1980s. So I went to elementary school, high school, college, and not one mention of Haiti in any of those programs. And uh, later on, once I started reading about Haitian history, I found out that Haiti played a huge part in um, the way people saw slavery and um, actually people of African descent running countries. Uh, in fact, there were three major revolutions that happened in modern history, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the, French, and the Haitian Revolution. But the Haitian Revolution rarely gets any type of mention. So that kind of set me down a path of trying to figure out exactly What's going on? Why isn't Haiti being mentioned um, in history? Uh, and oftentimes, you will see things that may be rewritten, like things that came directly from Haiti, but Haiti doesn't get credit. Sort of like, like the Louisiana Purchase um, was a main thing that uh, came out of the Haitian Revolution, but Haitian, Haiti doesn't get credit, right? There's Thomas Jefferson and his um, great deal-making abilities. So. So that made me dive deeper into Haitian history. And I actually published two books um, on the Haitian Revolution. And they're actually like children's books, like picture books that talk about a Haiti's path to independence. Um, so that's sort of like my main um, area of study, so to speak, is that, is that area between 1791 and 1804. Um, but once I hooked up with Sorel, he's like, you know what, we want to do a series. So the first series was the Haitian Revolution. And so it went, and it was very well. I think it was very, it very went very well. So we got together again and we we're like, you know what, let's do something else. So I wanted to touch on another subject and he gave me the opportunity to pick the subject on what we're going to talk about. So I wanted to talk about things that shaped Haiti. Um, the Haitian Revolution shaped Haiti, like Haiti as we know it today. And also another big factor that seldom talked about that also shaped Haiti is the era of the U.S. occupation. Um, the U.S. invaded and occupied Haiti for 19 years, um, starting in 1915 to 1934. And there were very big ramifications, and it was sort of a uh, uh, I don't want to say a scar, but people still living, there are generations that came out of that 
um, occupation, that people are still deal that people are still dealing with the psyche of that a foreign country coming in and taking over your country. So um, so I started to read about it and I started to get into it. Um, actually, I'm writing a book on a part of it and it's um, the revolution that happened um, within that, well, not the revolution, but the resistance that happened within that occupation of Haiti, but it started way before 1915. Um, so what I'm going to do today, I'll, I'll put together a little presentation for you guys. Because um, I think I like doing things that are very visual. So hopefully everyone can kind of see um, the pictures that I'm about to go across. Because I'm, I'm going to kind of like go through these pictures quite quickly and, and talk a little bit about each picture. I have about 40 images that I'm going to share. But I'm not going to spend too much time on each one. And hopefully it's going to tell the story of um, the U.S. occupation of Haiti. Um, what led up to it, and ultimately um, what was left after the U.S. left in 1934. So hopefully you guys enjoy. So let's start off. I, I'm kind of unconventional with my presentations. I kind of like to start somewhere where you won't think um, a presentation like this would start. So the first image that I'm going to pull up on the screen is an image of a steamship. And this was actually very instrumental, a, a very big invention um, in the early 1800s. Because prior to the invention of the steamship, um, the only way you could get cargo and troops and things all around the world was through sailboats, right? You had these huge sails on these ships. And depending on the sail, on, on the wind, would determine if you were going to leave the dock that day or that week or even months you know you could be delayed because the winds have been unfriendly so the steamship was a huge invention because it because it required an engine and the engine would would get the ship out of the harbor and go where it needs to go but the thing that the steamship needed a massive amount of was coal right so Right now, the U.S. is building their navy. So we're talking about like the mid-1800s right now. And it, the U.S. is coming up as a big superpower in the world, particularly in the Western Hemisphere. So now they're building up their navy, and the advent of the steamship is very important because they have uh, controlling interests in areas in the Caribbean, in the, in the Pacific, and a lot of different places. So in order for them to get their steamship fleet around, they needed um, uh, like a lot of stations. So this is just kind of like a map of where U.S. had interest. So if you think, if, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but this blue dot right here represents New York. And in order to get to the Caribbean, which is like right around here, and then the South Wait, America... Uh -huh. I'm sorry? Hey, Franz, we're actually not seeing the picture you showed. Oh, you don't see it? No. All we see is your screen that has your folders from your... Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's not good. So, are you seeing... I'm seeing your pointer pointing to your screen. Are, are you using two screens at a time? Oh, you know what? I probably am. Let me see something. If you're using two screens at a time, you're sharing one and not the other. So you need to move the picture over uh, and swap. Uh, uh, all right, let me do this. What do you see now? Uh, your folders. More folders. See, all right, let me go to new share. Oh, Microsoft. Anything, anything different? We see a black screen and a solid bar in the middle. All right, let's see. Do this. Are you able to unplug one screen? Now I'm seeing the presentation. You're good to go now. Okay, 
you see the presentation now. All right. I see the presentation. You can go in full screen mode now. All right. So now do you see like the steamship? Yes, and we're seeing it inside of the equivalent of power. Oh, okay, okay. I do slideshow so we can see the whole thing. Is that better? There you go. Perfect. Now we're talking. All right, now we're talking. All right, so now you see the coal guy and the map. That's correct. All right, very good. Can you see my can you see my pointer going across? Yes, we can. All right, fantastic. Thank you. All right, so now talking about going back to um, the U.S. interest and how uh, let's see where we go and how um, the ships used to get around. So um, you have U.S. has interest over here is the Caribbean. So the steamships would have to come here and then get some coal to get more coal. And then they could go like, to South America. In order to get to the Pacific, they would have to go all the way around South America, right? Get through here. And then now you could go to Mexico, the West Coast, and over here is Hawaii, and then over here, like the Philippines. So it required a lot of coal. So one ship on a ship can hold that much coal to get from one place to another to complete a full journey. So this caused a problem, but the solution was to have convenient coaling stations in different parts of the world. So one of the more con one of the coaling stations that we all know of is Guantanamo Bay. Uh, Guantanamo Bay was is in Cuba, and that was a very convenient coaling station for the United States. But even a better location was the Mol San Nicolas in Haiti, in the northwest part of Haiti. So. The, the Americans were very interested in getting that type of coaling station in Haiti. And this is like the, the 1885 to 1890, right? So what they wanted to do was negotiate some type of lease arrangement where the United States would lease that port, that coaling station from Haiti so that they could store massive amounts of coal there so when their ships get down, they can refuel, right? So the Mole Saint Nicolas became a very important part of the U.S. Navy, and they wanted to control that whole area. So what did they do? At that time um, in Haitian history, the president was uh, Pre President Flor Florville Hippolyte. So Hippolyte actually came into power by overthrowing another president called La Legitime, and Hippolyte was kind of like negotiating with the U.S. In fact, it was the U.S. that helped people get that presidency. So uh, the story goes that the U.S. wanted to control that coaling station. So they approached Legitime's person in the U.S. And Legitime was like, you know what? We can't sell you this coaling station. We can't even lease it to you because the U.S.'s demands were so much at the time. So they didn't even want they wanted the coaling station, but they also didn't want Haiti to lease any other part of their territory to any other foreign power, including Germany, Spain, Great Britain, or anyone. So Legitime was like, you know what? We can't do that for you. I'm sorry. So they approached Hippolyte, who was actually starting a rebellion in Haiti to overthrow Legitime. So they said, you know what? We can help this guy. The U.S. wanted to help have their own guy in there that could grant them concessions. So now you have Hippolyte. Um, the U.S. starts giving him um, all types of support for his insurrection against the current administration in Haiti. And also on Hippolyte's side was this person uh, you may have heard of, Antinor Fermé. Now, Antinor Fermé at this time was one of Haiti's leading intellectuals. Right? In fact, his claim to fame was a book that he wrote called The Equality of the Human Races. And he wrote this book in direct contention to um, an essay that was circulating all around Europe that was written by a French, um, like a French philosopher called The Inequality of Human Races, which claimed white supremacy and that the, the African race was uh, inferior to whites. And leading scholars at that time was taking that essay and they were actually really believing in um, that study from that racist um, French professor. 
So Antonin Cormet, who did a lot of his studies in Paris, um, came across a lot of his peers, his white peers, and they were kind of looking down on him after that essay started making its round. So he actually penned the equality of the human races, which actually got worldwide recognition even more than the inequality of the human races. So now Antonin Cormet is sort of like a hero. He's a leading intellectual, and he goes back down to Haiti in support of Hippolyte. So he actually has ties with the United States as well and is able to get guns and all types of ammunition, ammunition and munition uh, for the guns from the United States to help President Hippolyte in his insurrection. So they actually do that. Hippolyte gains the presidency. So now the United States wants to make them good on their promises, right? So now they start approaching Ferme and Hippolyte and they say, okay, now we need to negotiate this coaling station. So, but the, the way Haiti was working at that time, the population was scared of the administration selling out Haiti to the Americans. So the Americans are now a growing power in the Western Hemisphere and eventually in the world. And Haiti is pretty much their neighbor to the, to the South, right? So Fermé is stalling the United States. He doesn't want to do the deal because if he starts selling out some of the country to the United States, then they can get thrown out of office and lose public support. So the U.S. is starting to really put pressure on them to make this deal. So what they do, they get a new ambassador to Haiti in 1889, and they send this person down to Haiti to negotiate directly with Parme. And this person was Frederick Douglass. Now, Frederick Douglass got his claim, as we know, he was an ex-slave, and then after he was free, then he became a, a big politician. Um, but around this time, Frederick Douglass had a lot of, uh, I mean, he was optimistic about after the Civil War that, you know, the United States was heading in the right direction, right? So they ended slavery, Abraham Lincoln is in office, and he's doing a lot of these different progressive things. But as time goes on, it seems like with the whole Jim Crow era, it seems like the U.S. is reverting back to their racist ways, and the South has always been that way. But what put the, but what put pretty much was the straw that broke the camel's back for Frederick Douglass was in 18, I believe it was 1896, was the Plessy versus Ferguson case, which said pretty much separate but equal. So that actually kind of, once that case went through the courts, it actually, you know, Douglass pretty much became distrusting of the motives of the United States. So now Douglass, is negotiating with Vermeer. Douglas is down in Haiti, and he's negotiating the lease of this port to with Vermeer. And Douglas is pretty much sympathetic to the Haitian cause. So they're negotiating, but they're not really getting anywhere. They're actually really becoming more friends than anything else. So the U.S. starts really getting impatient. So they bring back Frederick Douglas, and in a few months they send him back down there. This time with the general, um, this big you know, important white general, and also seven gunships that they sent down to Port-au-Prince along with Douglas and this general to negotiate with Vermeer. And this time, the general took over the conversation and they were being very, very pressing on Antonin Vermeer. So now um, they're saying that, you know, if you guys pretty much, we have these gunboats in your harbor, and if you don't sign this deal, we're going to bombard the town. But for a man, it's like, you know what? We have no problems with leasing you the port, but the other demands we can't live with, which is pretty much, uh, if we can't lease our land to other countries, then how are we a sovereign nation, was his argument. So with all that happening, gunboats in the harbor, Antonin Roman still says no. And he actually called the bluff of the United States and sent Douglas, the general, and the seven warships back to the United States. And that actually cemented Antonin Roman's, Roman's legacy in Haiti as a hero. Uh, and, but one of the things that 
was kind of like uh, the U.S. didn't know um, during those negotiations was Ferman had an ace in the hole, which was this guy, um, Hannibal Price, who was actually a Haitian U.S. minister. So Hannibal Price was in the United States, and he was a very skilled politician. He was Haitian. He was uh, the son of an Englishman, and also um, his mother was Haitian. So he cultivated a lot of different um, uh, relationships in Washington, and he knew what was going on in Haiti with the negotiations, so he kept a close eye on it. So he actually knew that it was a bluff by the United States, because if the United States actually did attack Haiti at that time, which it was an election time, so they knew that the Republicans would never gain, the population won't gain um, seats um, because it would look pretty much bad that they bombarded this um, black nation. So Hannibal Price sent a letter, pretty much a telegram down to Ferment. And as Ferment is sitting across from Douglas and the general, he's holding the letter in his hand, knowing that they were not going to bombard the town. So Hannibal Price was sort of like a hero, an unspoken of hero um, at this time as well. So that kind of like started, like this is prior to the invasion. This is the end of the 19th century, but this is how like the relations kind of started with the United States um, and Haiti. So there was already a little bit of tension going into the 20th century. So now you have another incident that happened prior to the invasion of Haiti, and it was in December 1914. So Haiti had a gold reserve, and the currency was actually backed by gold, and this reserve was used to pay the government, um, the military, and it's pretty much how the, it was functioning at the time. But um, I, think, I think you guys should remember about the debt that uh, the France that France imposed on Haitians for, so that they can be recognized as a sovereign nation in 1825. In 1825, uh, France placed a debt on Haiti of 160 million francs so that Haiti could be recognized, and those and that money went to uh, the previous slaveholders, the slave masters. When Haiti got its independence, they lost all of their land, all of their slaves, so they made Haiti pay them back. Right, and that debt lasted in Haiti for many, many, many years, decades. Right, so what happened? Haiti paid off that debt, but they had to take out other loans to keep afloat because eighty percent of all of the income that was coming in to Haiti was going off paying the French. So they had to get other loans in order to pay off this debt. I mean, to for the country to run. So. Now, most of the loans they got were from the United States. So when the United States in 1914, they felt like, you know what? Haiti is going through a little financial crisis right now and we're probably not gonna be able to get our money back. So they sent the United States Marines into Haiti to confiscate $500,000 worth of gold, right? And this was in 1914, so today's money that's about $11 million, right? So that so they pretty much walked in to the bank. They landed in Port-au-Prince, marched to the bank, confiscated the gold, put it back on the boat, and sent it back to New York, right? And they deposited that gold in the National City Bank of New York, which today is Citibank, right? So now a little unknown thing was that um, Citibank, particularly acquired a major um, share in the Bank Nationale, which was controlled by the French at the time. And so the Citibank, which is in New York, bore a lot of controlling interest in that bank. In fact, the American flag was flying on the Bank Nationale in Haiti because they controlled that bank. So it was pretty much like they sent the Marines over there to confiscate the gold it was sort of like a transfer of funds. And it made the, the New York bankers more comfortable that they had Haitians, Haiti's gold reserves in their banks instead of down in Haiti. But the ramifications of that robbery was pretty significant, right? So now, 
That happened in 1914. So like I said, that gold was responsible for paying the government, the military, and a lot of other di different things that were happening in Haiti that helped Haiti run. So now you don't have that income. So now the country is going into chaos, particularly at the government level. So starting in 1911, there were seven, seven different presidents that took office in four years, right? Particularly ending in um, the Bill Brunt Sam, South, right? So this was kind of like a, partic uh, a really dark spot in Haitian history where Sam uh, feared he was going to be overthrown. So he actually took out a, over a hundred, I believe it was 167 political prisoners out of jail and assassinated, executed all of them. And those political prisoners were from the bourgeois, the, the bourgeoisie political class, right? So these weren't just peasants he assassinated. He assassinated people with very uh, prominent families in Haiti. So when that happened, a mob chased him out of the presidential palace and he, Sam, ran over to the French embassy that was in the country. So the mob actually went into the French embassy, pulled him out, and they literally tore him to pieces in front of the French embassy, right? So now the country is in chaos. So who's looking from afar? The United States. So at this time, the president of the United States is Woodrow Wilson. And they already had plans. They, they never forgot about the Molson Nicolás, but now it's 1914. And there's a lot of different things that, that uh, the initial negotiations with Frederick Douglass was about 25 years ago. So now the U.S. really has interest all around the world. And there were a lot of different things happening at that time that I'm going to get into. But the U.S. already had plans of invading Haiti and taking that coaling station, the Mola Sindicola. So once they saw that happening with all the ins insurrections, they were like, you know what? Right now is the perfect time to go in and occupy Haiti and invade Haiti because now we have a reason, right? But really, it was the U.S. that caused all of that tension in Haiti because they confiscated that goal and pretty much strangled the economic system until it finally was right for the U.S. to go in. So they, can, they really made those conditions for them to go down there. So now President Woodrow Wilson is like, okay, let's go down there and invade Haiti and sends troops into Haiti July 28, 1915. So now why occupy Haiti? There were a lot of different reasons the Americans said they wanted, why they wanted to send troops down into Haiti. One was the fear of Germans, the, the coaling station, the Mont Saint Nicolas, the Panama Canal uh, was in construction at this time, um, the Haitian debt to the US and overall control of the Caribbean. So now let's get into the Germans. So it's 1915, World War, um, World War One is pretty much happening right now. And Germans are in Haiti. The Germans were in Haiti ever since independence, right? And they became merchants. Uh, in fact, Dessalines, uh, the first chief of state of Haiti, welcomed the Germans um, into Haiti. And uh, the Germans actually were there for a while, and they actually, Dessalines had a clause in the Constitution that said no foreign person can own land in Haiti. But the way the Germans circumvented that Constitution was they married Haitian women. So now you marry a Haitian woman, now you can own land. So they actually bought a lot of land and they became merchants, very powerful merchants in the country. In fact, there were times um, where they would wield their power against the Haitian state. Uh, there was one particular case in 1897 when um, the Haitian police went to arrest a worker in a, in a German merchant's um, business. And the German merchant actually fought with the officer. And so the officer had him arrested. Well, the German Kaiser at the time did not take that well. So they sent a letter to the Haitian president at the time, which was uh, President Sam, not Sam, the one that got killed, but actually a relative who was president of his in 1897. And they said they want the immediate release of um, the merchant 
and they want five thousand dollars for each day he was locked up he wants the the police that locked him up fired and the judges that tried him he wants them the germans want them fired as well right so now sam is like okay well this is crazy and the germans said if you don't do all of this we're gonna send a warship to your harbor in port-au-prince and bomb the town so Sam was like, okay, well, what, what's going on here? So they released the president. The warship actually comes into Port-au-Prince Harbor and demands $20,000 on the spot or else they're going to pretty much pull the cannons. So Sam is like looking for, towards the Americans for help, looking to the French for help. Nobody would help him. And he was forced to pay that $20,000. So the Germans were actually very powerful in Haiti and the U.S. knew that. So now they have, and the Germans are actually a growing power in Europe. They didn't really want to occupy Haiti or do anything like that. But the U.S. used that sort of like as an excuse. The U.S. was very um, like paranoid about Germany. So, they, so once the U.S. invaded Germany, they actually closed down all of their businesses and actually arrested a lot of them, put them in prisons, um, and stripped them of their land. Um, during that time of uh, prior to occupation. Um, also, another thing was, of course, they wanted the Mole Saint Nicolas. Uh, also, that's happening at this time is the building of the Panama Canal. So, the Panama Canal is very important when it comes to Haiti because Haiti, the way where Haiti is situated, is over here, the northwest of Haiti, the, the Mole Saint Nicolas, and then you have Guantanamo Bay, and over here is the Windward Passage. Now, the Windward Passage is very important because you could just go straight through here and where's Panama? Panama, uh, where did I see Panama? Where's my map? Okay, here we go. So, Panama is over here. So, the U.S. was like, instead of having to go all the way around South America to get to the Pacific, let's cut a canal right here through Panama. So now they could go mobilize their Navy, send them straight through the Windward Passage, where they could dock, get some more coal, go right through the Panama Canal, and boom, they're right here in the, in the Pacific, where you have Hawaii, you have the Philippines, and all that other activity that they were having in the, in the Pacific. So, but they needed Haiti to complete that project, because the Panama Canal was very important and they didn't want any of the European powers to have use of it, especially Germany. So they wanted to control all of the Caribbean nations so that no one would come in, no European powers could come in and threaten, and the U.S. could have sole control of that canal. So now you have the Panama Canal in play, you have convenient access uh, to the West. Oh, here it is. I knew I had that map in here somewhere. So now they want to control that port in Haiti so that they can easily get there. And that was very important to the U.S. So now the U.S. Marines dock in July 1915, and they immediately go take over the government. So they take over all of the custom houses. They go into the, the parliament. They control everything in the government. Uh, they control the financial all of the financials, so all the tax revenue, all the merchant revenue, all the money coming into Haiti now is going through the U.S.'s hands. And their first priority was to make sure that all of the U.S. debts were paid, right? So now the U.S. debts need to be paid, so they start taking all of the money that's coming in through Haiti, and they're paying off these um, American banks, right? And also, they rewrite the Constitution. First thing they needed though was a puppet regime because they didn't want to make it, they didn't want to just go in there and do everything themselves. So they were very experienced with overthrowing governments and doing this. So they, the, what worked to their advantage is to find someone like a, of that country, like a, a black person of that country, and put them in power as a puppet regime where they're actually the ones pulling the strings. So the president at that time they put into power was uh, Sudre Dottignan, right? So they put him in power, and now they're pretty much just telling him what to do, right? So 
first thing they do is they want to rewrite the Constitution. Uh, the Dessaline Constitution, the one clause in that Constitution that stuck through all the presidencies, because every time a new president comes into power, one of the first things they do is rewrite the Constitution. Like Haiti has had over 50 different constitutions, right? So, but the one thing that always stuck was the Dessaline Clause, which stated that no foreign white person can own land in Haiti. So when the U.S. came in and they put in the puppet regime with Dr. Now, that was one of the first things they changed. And that opened the way for American businesses to come in and own huge pieces of land and pretty much start the plantation system all over again in Haiti. So another thing that was happening, though, um, a lot of uprisings were happening amongst the peasant class. Because now you have all of these huge um, corporations coming in and pretty much starting a plantation style society. So now the peasants are, or, or the farmers uh, that pretty much made their living selling their goods to the merchants, they're pretty much going out of business now. So they start to, um, they start to revolt. They start to fight back, right? But now the U.S. Marines have no mercy on it. I mean, they're killing these people on site. Uh, I mean, the U.S., obviously, they came in with machine guns and all of this type of advanced weaponry. And, I mean, you know, the, the, the rural class in Haiti, I mean, they have their usual machetes and sticks and rocks and maybe an old gun. It was no match for the Marines. Right? So a lot of them, they just pretty much took to the mountains, but they didn't stop fighting back. Right? So, there was, so there was a huge movement in Haiti against the occupation, and that was called the Kako, the Kako movement, right? And um, they started fighting against the Marines. So the Marines would have to use different types of strategies in order to get um, the Kako pretty much uh, in line, right? Because the Kako used guerrilla warfare in Haiti. So the Marines were not used to that. They were actually, the Kako used a lot of voodoo, and stuff which scared the Marines. And uh, so what they had to do, the Marines had to do was build uh, a Haitian army in order to fight the Kako, right? So they started a Genda Marie, which is pretty much they recruited Haitians and gave them a salary and they used them to fight the Kako movement, the Kako rebellion. So now you have uh, pretty much like a uh, police of blacks and one of their main they were they were built to fight the Kako but and another thing that they wanted the Genda Marie to do was recruit people to help build roads in Haiti because one of the reasons the Kako were very successful was because there were really no roads in the rural areas of Haiti so there was an old um an old law like back to the Boye days like in 1825 that said, if you lived in an area and they needed something to be done in that area, then we, the government could go in and have you build like roads or, or build a fort or build something. Like you had to pretty much go and do it. So that law pretty much wasn't really in effect since 1825. But the U.S. Marines started going through the Constitution, and they saw this law in the books, and they was like, oh, this is perfect. So we could get the, the rural class to build roads to help us find the Kako. So they actually used the Genda Marie, the new Genda Marie, to recruit the peasants. And this form of labor was called Corbett. So they would go to each of these, like, peasant homes and take out all the men and they would pretty much string them up together and force them into labor, uh, which they weren't paid for. So it was pretty much another form of slavery because they were worked against their will. And they were, and sometimes the corvée system was designed so that you won't have to leave your area. But with this, you had they had the they had the men going to all different parts of Haiti, and they weren't allowed to leave that area until the work was done, which could take months, sometimes years. So it was another form of slavery that was um, pretty much put together. So this actually formed a huge resistance movement. 
right? So once they saw that another form of slavery was happening, and most of the time it was a white person that was giving the orders, then they were like, you know what? This is slavery all over again. We're going to start this resistance movement. And one of the biggest um, rebels of that movement was a man by the name of Charmaine Perrault. So Shalman was actually from uh, a well-to-do family. His family owned a lot of land and, um, and uh, dealt with a lot of merchants. And they were actually pretty well-to-do. Um, they were from the area in Haiti called Hench, uh, which is kind of like along the border uh, with the Dominican Republic. So Shalman was an officer um, in the Haitian army before the occupation. So when the, when the Marines came in, everyone pretty much dropped their guns. And Sharman was pretty much like a nationalist. He was like, we need to fight this occupation. They're coming over to take over our land. Why are we just laying down to these Americans? So Sharman was like, you know what? When they came over to his town uh, where he was control of, they ordered him to lower down the Haitian flag so that they can raise the American flag. And he refused to. So he was arrested. Uh, he wasn't arrested at that time, but they sent him home, right? And he you know, pretty much he took off his uniform and said he doesn't want to be a part of this, and he went home. Um, but eventually, they went to his home and they arrested him. Uh, they arrested him, put him in prison in um, La Cat in Ocat, um, Cat Haitian, and um, he was there for a while. But he was actually set broken out by one of the guards in the prison where he was at. So they actually left the prison together, um, dressed in disguise. I think they were dressed like um, as, uh, as women or something like that, going on a voodoo pilgrimage or something. So they made it all the way back to Hinch and um, that's where he started his um, activities. So he actually started a widespread rebellion and he recruited Kapo, um, I think it was about like 15 to 20,000 and, uh, and they actually had a really big movement that the U.S. Marines could not suppress. In fact, to fight the Congos, the U.S. was, the, it was the first time the U.S. actually flew over an area and dropped bombs on a village. Uh, it was one of the first uses of bombardment by airplanes um, dealing with the Haitian Congo. Um So Sean Mine, I mean, he was operating from 18, uh, from 1918 up to 1920, 1919, I'm sorry. And um, he was eventually captured. Uh, of course, there was um, the U.S. used a spy to infiltrate his network. Uh, and they went in there, uh, two Marines and the spy. Uh, the Marines dressed in, like, put shoe polish on their faces. Uh, so pretty much were in blackface. They infiltrated the camp, the camp shot Perrault at point blank range and, uh, and took his body. So now you may have, you may be in, uh, familiar with this image that's on the screen now. Um, it's actually one of the lasting images um, from the US occupation that most people remember. Uh, that's Shaman Perrault right there. So once they shot him, they took his body um, because they wanted to tell, they wanted to make sure that everyone knew that he was dead. So once they took his body, they took it back to the Marine camp, they placed him on a door, they kind of tied him up. And you see that flag right there. That's actually Peralt's um, flag, where it's like a Haitian flag. And over here, you can kind of see like a, a crucifix, um, kind of like at the top of the flag. So he's draped in the Haitian flag, they have a crucifix, and the way his body is linked, lent, like linked to the side, it reminded people of like a, like a Christ-like image, right? So for the U.S. Marines, they took this photograph and they made thousands of leaflets and they put it on the plane and they dropped it over the villages to let them know that shot their, their leader of this rebellion is dead. But it actually had the, the, the meaning of doing that was to quell the rebellion, but it actually had the opposite effect. And because of that Christ-like crucifixion, he actually became a martyr, and the fighting actually became more intense. Um, but the Congo movement was actually crushed um, about a year after uh, Shaw Mine's assassination. And, uh, they, and uh, one of the last uh, Congos was a man by the name of Batraville. 
and uh, they assassinated him as well. And that was sort of like the end of the Kako movement. So the main rebellion the U.S. crushed down, and that was between 1918 and 1919. So now with the Kako crushed, the U.S. kind of like paved the way for um, American businesses to come and set up shop in Haiti. Uh, and pretty much what they did was uh, they took over, uh, at, at the time, there were farmers that had plots of land all over Haiti. And the big corporations like Hasco, a Haitian American Sugar Company, they couldn't get enough consolidated land in order to build their plantation style. So they had the U.S. government confiscate all of the farmers' lands uh, so that they can consolidate all of these lands. So a lot of the farmers were like, that was their only way of sustaining themselves and their families. So they ended up working for Pasco. and But the thing is, Pasco was paying them like very, very low wages. Like sometimes, like, I guess like an equivalent, I think it was like 40 cents a day, which today is an equivalent of like $4 a day. And the conditions of working at for these companies were terrible, right? So there were a lot of so you know there were a lot of strikes and, and this that. I mean, it was just terrible work experiences for uh, the present class. So it caused a mass migration. So people were like, you know what? We're gonna get out of Haiti uh, because the conditions are deplorable. The U.S. is pretty much causing all of this disruption in our way of living. So a lot of patients, they went next door to the Dominican Republic. A lot of them emigrated to Cuba. But once they got to those different places, it was the same type of atmosphere as was in Haiti. It was U.S.-run corporations and plantation-style work. So they couldn't avoid all of that stuff. So I mean, so tens of thousands of patients emigrated to the Dominican Republic. Tens of thousands, I mean, like upwards of 50 and 60,000 emigrated to Cuba, but they found themselves on plantations um, all the same. Right? So now you have all this um, bad press that's happening in the United States because what, they, what the U.S. Marines were doing, they were pretty much indiscriminately killing hundreds, thousands of Haitians um, if they weren't falling in line. With the occupation, so that and most most of them were the peasant class in, in the rural areas of Haiti, because uh, they accused all of them of being Kako supporters. Uh, one of the main phrases that the Americans would hear from like regular um, rural people, uh, the peasant class, was "me Kako ne," because the U.S. would go in there and question like, "Where are the Kakos at? Where are they hiding at?" And they would be like, "Me me Kako ne," right? So. If the, hate, if the U.S. Marines felt like it, they would burn down their villages. They would kill dozens of them at a time. In fact, one story that kind of like put it over the edge was the Marines, uh, they, they went into a, a voodoo priest's home and him and another uh, Haitian, and they walked them about two miles, made them dig their own graves before they shot and killed them. And this story made it all the way up to the United States Senate. And the Senate was like, yo, what is going on down there? Why? I mean, what's your explanation for doing something like that? And the Marines were like, oh, well, this type of stuff happens all the time down there in Haiti. And it horrified the, that government official. So the government official actually wrote a letter saying that it seems to be like the, the Marine officers are killing people left and right down there. And that letter actually made it to the U.S. press, and the U.S. press pretty much ran with it. So, and then it caused a lot of bad publicity uh, for the Marines down there in Haiti. So now, the Marines are like, okay, all right, let's rethink what we're doing down here. So they actually started now going down there to do what they actually set out to do, which is trying to build up the country and make it a better place and this, that, and the other. So now they start... Uh, in fact, <laughs> before I get into what they did, um, President Warren Harding, so this guy was running for office around the time all this bad press was happening. So he used the, the, the Haitian occupation to gain 
uh, pretty much an advantage over the current uh, incumbent administration that was down in Haiti. But he was saying, oh, it's deplorable down there. They don't know what they're doing down there, this, that, and the other. And actually, he gained a lot of favor based off of accusing the government of all these horrible things that were happening in Haiti and actually won the presidency. So now he's up in office and he actually starts a commission to go down there and find out what's going on in Haiti, right? So they send a commission down there and the commission comes back with all of this information, but it, it focuses more on the cultural practices of Haitians more than the atrocities that were being committed by the Marines. So they start talking about, oh, it's voodoo happening down there. And um, they decapitated one of the Marines and ate his body and all types of different crazy things um, were coming out of that commission. So really nothing really happened and actually worked against <laughs> uh, the Haitians favor because now all these stories about voodoo practice and this and the other started making its rounds in the United States. But nonetheless, the U.S. wanted to go down there and try to start building up infrastructure and different things in Haiti. So in 19, like around 1921, 1922, they started the construction of the presidential palace. Uh, the previous presidential palace was actually destroyed, like, uh, like, I believe it was like in the early 19th century, there was a bomb that was set off in the previous presidential palace that killed the president. Um, so that palace was still there. So the U.S. was like, you know what, let's build the presidential palace over again. So they actually created a presidential palace. They built all these roads around the country. They built irrigation systems. They actually built schools. Um, they built medical schools. Um, in fact, one of the more prominent students at the, one of the U.S.-run medical schools uh, actually became the dictator, Francois Duvalier was a student at that school. So now the U.S. is actually really trying to make an effort to provide infrastructure in the, company, in the country. But um, they start doing it the wrong way. So now you have strikes that's happening um, around the turn of uh, 1930, like 1929, 1930. So they built this huge campus in uh, Damien uh, called the Service Technique. So now the U.S. is like, you know what, what the Haitians need, the, Haitian, the U.S. is providing all of this policy for Haitians. Like they know what the Haitians need and they're not really mis listening to the Haitians of what they want and what they need. So one of the things that were put on the Haitians was they said that they wanted the Haitians to have more vocational trainings, like specified trainings, like in agriculture and engineering, and, and this, that, and the other, so that they can actually sustain themselves, so that they can have a skill, so that they can go out and get a job, and so that they, the U.S. goal was to create a huge middle class in Haiti. So, and the Haitians were actually for it. It's like, you know what, that's great. If you're gonna build these schools, then we're gonna take advantage. So they built this huge campus in Damien called a service technique. But the problem was, they focused too much on the vocational training and the Haitians actually wanted more of a classical type training, including the arts. And the U.S. eliminated the arts completely from the curriculum and just was training them on how to get a job. But the Haitians didn't like that, right, especially the students. It was like, wait, you want me to be competent in getting a job? That's pretty much like another way of slavery, wage slavery. Right. And also a fumble that the U.S. had was all the teachers that they brought into these companies, into these schools were American teachers and none of them spoke French and none of them spoke Creole. So it was always, and they were highly paid and they were paid by the Haitian government, not the U.S. So the money was coming from Haiti to pay these teachers that can't even speak French, can't speak Creole, and are not teaching the things that the students want to learn. So the students actually confront the principal of the school at this campus. And they said, we want this, we want that. And the principal was like, no. And on top of that, the principal took away scholarships that were promised to the students. So now the students are getting a bill for going to this school when they're supposed to be paid for. 
Well, that was the straw that broke the camel's back and the students went on strike. So they actually went, walked out of the campus and they marched to Port-au-Prince. And along the march, all of these other people started marching along with them, the high schools, um, the, the workers, even some people in government was marching with the students. Um, and then the rural class started coming in, marching with the students. And it just became a whole big strike and it lasted for many weeks. So now up in the north of Haiti, there was also strikes. So the, the, the rural class came and they were marching towards half Haitian. And then that was pretty much like the, this, it freaked out the Marines and the Marines started sh unloading their machine guns into the crowd and they killed 12 people. And, and that was pretty much like the end of all of the, the like U.S. trying to like do educational stuff and this and the other. It just didn't mesh well with the Haitians and what the Haitians wanted. The U.S. kept on trying to put their policy onto the Haitians and the Haitians were resisting. Um, I, pretty much like if you look at other um, areas in the Caribbean that the U.S. occupied, like uh, Cuba, Dominican Republic, one main thing, Venezuela, one main thing you see in those areas uh, is baseball, right? So you can see a lot of baseball players coming out of the Dominican Republic, Cuba, Venezuela, but it never stuck in Haiti because of the resistance. Haiti is like one of the only places, I mean, not one of the only places, but they never took baseball and they stuck as soccer as their main national sport. So that just was sort of like a sign of that type of resistance that was happening in Haiti. And other types of resistance was happening too. So now you have other activists um, that are now writing um, and singing songs and, and, and pretty much going towards the arts as a form of rebellion towards uh, the United States. So you have these leading intellectuals like Jean Price Mars, Dante Belgard, Jacques Roumain, who all are putting together these works as pretty much uh, a rebellion, a silent kind of rebellion, but it was actually very, very effective in getting lit, getting the United States to leave their country. Uh, so John Price Mars, who was a leading intellectual anthropologist, had all types of thoughts on the U.S. occupation. Uh, Dante Belagard was actually a politician in the occupation government. But um, once he saw that things weren't going the Haitians' way, he was like, you know what? He left the government. Well, actually, he was excused from the government. And he started his own campaign going to all the other um, uh, islands in the Caribbean, um, talking, uh, speaking out against the U.S. occupation of Haiti. He, went, he was actually an ambassador of Haiti to the United States. Um, he, uh, he went over to France and and Spain all talk, trying to get support for the Haitians to get rid of the U.S. Um, in Haiti. And then, of course, Jacques Roman, who was um, a very big advocate against the, the occupation of Haiti. And, of course, you may know him by his work called uh, Masters of the Do, uh, which is actually a very great book. If you haven't read that book, I would you know, definitely be a good uh, book, which depicted uh, the rural class, the peasant class, um, a lot of books were read about government and this and the other, but he had the actual first book that touched on life as a peasant in Haiti. And Masters of the Do was sort of like a title that uh, a lot of the peasants used to say, a phrase a lot of the peasants used to say, saying they're pretty much masters of nothing else, just the do of, um, you know, that they, the water that they use to grow their crops. So coupled with uh, other, the student strike rebellion, and the intellectual activists, and that was pretty much the straw that broke the camel's back to get the U.S. Uh, start the evacuation of the U.S. Um, so the so with all this activity going on, the U.S. was like, all right, you know what? Fine, let's have elections. And so the first demo real democratically democratic election wasn't really a democratic election, but they called it a democratic election where the people came out, they chose their candidate, and they actually voted in Haiti during the occupation. So the person that the Haitians chose was Senor Vincent. So this person, I mean, he did okay, like his, he was against the occupation. But once 
he actually got into office, then he made a lot, he still made a lot of concessions to the United States, right? Which the, which the people that voted him into power did not like. Even the parliament, uh, the parliament was actually reinstated back in 1918 when they changed the constitution uh, the, the the United States disbanded the, the Haitian parliament at gunpoint because they wanted to change that Dessalines clause. So the U.S. Marines actually went into the parliament. When they wouldn't change the clause, they excused all of the parliament members and they wrote their own constitution. Um, so when Stenio Vincent came back in, he actually came in, they put the parliament back together, but they still left that clause that the U.S. Um, have put in where foreign owners, foreign whites can own land and you know, the people that elected them in thought they were going to get rid of that clause. It didn't happen. Um, so he actually became, so I mean, his idea was that we have to work with the United States. There's no way we're not going to, there's no way we're going to survive as a country without having some type of relationship with the United States. Uh, so he made a lot of concessions. Some say too many concessions. And also another stain on Vincent's presidency was the, the, the dealings with the Dominican Republic. Um, at this time, at the time of Stenio Vincent's presidency was the time of uh, Rafael Trujillo, who was the Dominican um, president at the time. So Trujillo was very, even though he had a Haitian mother, he was very racist against the Haitians, right? So along the border, there was a, something, uh, an event that happened, I believe it was 1937, called the Parsley Massacre, where Trujillo, Trujillo actually sent his Marines or his military to the border and slaughtered tens of thousands of Haitians along, uh, uh, like in a, a couple of days' time. Uh, and it was called the Parsley Massacre because he actually the military would ask the, the person living at the border town to pronounce parsley. And there was a way the Haitians would pronounce parsley and the Dominicans would pronounce parsley. It's something to do with the R, the rolling of the R, the Haitians couldn't do. So if you couldn't pronounce it the right way, you were immediately executed. And tens of thousands of Haitians died that way at that border. And at one, and Vincent, was pretty much accused of being a part of it because of the way he handled it. Um, he first, he didn't even acknowledge it happened at all. Then when his parliament said, you know, you have to, to do something, then um, he made an agreement with Trujillo that pretty much said, you know, give me $8 per death that happened. And Trujillo probably paid like two thirds of it, didn't even pay the whole indemnity back to Haiti and it was never talked about again. So Vincent, even though he was elected by the people, he still became, got in bed with the United States. So, the, so Vincent pretty much stays into the presidency up until the U.S. Marines um, actually withdrew. So they, the Marines said, Yo, you know what? We're going to put into place our financial person that's going to stay in Haiti to make sure that all of these banks are actually paid in full all the way up into the 1940s. But the last Marine actually left the island August 1st, 1934. And I have this picture of Haiti. This is actually after the earthquake, the presidential palace, but it was sort of like a, a, a depiction of how the U.S. actually left Haiti. Um, they pretty much went in there and they did what they wanted to do. They opened the way for American businesses. They didn't really do anything for the Haitian, the, 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 the biggest part of the population, which is the, the rural class. Um, the, the mulattoes, the elites, they came out okay, but the biggest part of the population still felt the ramifications. Uh, in fact, they were worse off after the U.S. Marines withdrew uh, from Haiti in 1934. So the lasting legacy of the occupation, I mean, if you ask me, it didn't really achieve as much as I'm sure the U.S. wanted to achieve in Haiti. Um, they pretty much left the place in shambles. People were 
um, worse off, especially the majority of the population was worse off after U.S. Marines withdrew. Um, so I can't say that it was a successful occupation. Uh, right, so they left the country, and then the, after, and that it pretty much set the stage for what happened next, which was the Duvalier regime, uh, because they centralized what the Marines did was centralize the government so that the ruling person, the president, would have pretty much unlimited powers all throughout the country. Before the U.S. Marines landed, it was very um, sectioned off. The powers were sectioned in the north, the west. The South, all the port towns um, pretty much had like their own governors. So when the U.S. Marines came into the country, they centralized that power in Port-au-Prince and gave the president a lot of power, um, which was meant for the U.S. But once the U.S. left, that system stayed the same. So now you have a, a problem where everyone has, everyone that comes into the presidency has all of this power to control the whole country. And at the end of the day, nobody does anything for the majority of the population. Um, it was like that before the presidency, but it was, I mean, before the occupation, but it became even worse after the occupation. So at the end of the day, um, there was this quote uh, that I found to be interesting by Bellegarde. Uh, it says, uh, the United States is too close and God is too far, <laughs> right? So I think that's sort of like the way the Haitians feel uh, about their relationship with the United States. Um, and of course, you know, you get into all of the recent things um, that the United States and the Haitians are actually going through over the past couple of decades. But as far as the, the occupation goes, um, I think the United States made out um, with what they wanted to achieve in Haiti. But as far as the Haitian is concerned, um, they could have done without that occupation. So uh, that's pretty much it for that part of it. Um, but like I said, all right. All right, guys, that's it. I'm going to end my, um, my recorded presentation there. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Uh, I did that presentation about two years ago, and there really wasn't any more to add to it. You know, if I did the presentation again, it would have been the exact same. <laughs> right. So why, why reinvent the wheel? Um, so I just uh, wanted to share that for today's program and um, see if you guys had uh, any questions uh, about that. So uh, let's see, is Dave still, still here? Yes, sir. Oh, OK, cool, cool, cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, man, so that was it. I know that was probably, I know I didn't send that to you early to take a look at it, but yeah. uh, if there was anything you want to add uh, to that, you know, please do so. Yeah, definitely. Um, a couple of things I'd like to add. Um, one is, uh, you mentioned the fact that um, the Haitian constitution was actually uh, revamped uh, during the occupation. And an interesting fact is that when the um, new constitution was, uh, was a, approved in Haiti in 1918, it was actually a future U.S. president, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, who wrote the constitution um, himself. He was, a, he was a, um admiral in the Navy at the time, and he actually um, famously said, um, the facts are that I wrote Haiti's constitution myself, and if I do say it, I think it's a pretty good constitution. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Yep. <laughs> you sure did. Yeah. And, you know, we're definitely going to, um, well, actually, another thing is that um, in regards to the investigation that was um, commissioned by President Harding, really it was influenced, that decision was influenced by the NAACP, uh, which at the time was being led by James Weldon Johnson. And Johnson, after he was actually the first uh, person, first African-American uh, designated to lead the NAACP, um, if you can believe that. And within a couple of months of being assigned to that position, he went on to Haiti on a mission to figure out what the US was actually doing in the country. And he um, went on this mission in 1920. 
and it was there that he re realized all of the um, bad, bad stuff that was happening in Haiti being done by the U.S. Um, Army, that he returned to the U.S. and published a series of articles to decry um, the actions that were being committed by the U.S. government in Haiti. And it was extremely embarrassing for, um, for Woodrow Wilson's government. And that's what led Harding to, um, to initiate this commission uh, once he became president in 1921. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I mean, like, as far as like President Harding, I don't know how much he really cared as, as, as opposed to like, he just wanted to find something you know, to accuse the, you know, the previous administration. Yeah, it was purely political. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You, you know, yeah. I mean, just using anything to, you know, gain an advantage. But um, yeah, yeah, I didn't know the NAACP part, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's see. Um, let's see if we have any questions in the chat room. Let's see what we got going on. Uh, let's see, can you bring up your volume? All right, Psyche. Uh, okay, we got someone from Brazil on here. That's pretty cool. Thank you. Uh, everybody raping currency. Uh, Dr. Knob looks white. Uh, a lot of the, the ruling, like I saw a notice of, uh, in the chat room earlier, you said like a lot of uh, the Haitians were light skinned or, or, or mixed race. And uh, like Haiti dealt is just like a lot of the other places in the Caribbean where you have where, where stemming from slavery where you had these white uh Europeans come in with the black slave with the enslaved black people and you know it, you know a, a lot of raping was happening so you have this whole new gener um generation of people which is the mixed class and mulatto class and they favored you know, a lot of them, I should say, favored, you know, their European ancestry rather than their African ancestry. And a lot of the fathers, the white fathers, they would send their kids, their mixed race kids to France to be educated and stuff like that. So once the revolution happened, uh, you know, you have this whole, that like, one thing that the, the blacks and the mulattoes agreed on was that the whites got to go, <laughs> right? But the, the mulattoes still felt superior to the blacks because they had like a lot more of the education and they had more wealth and stuff like that. So they assumed a lot of the leadership roles, especially after the, you know, Christoph um, um, died and the Republic took over. So one of the last thing, well, one of the legacies from that is like, you always have these heads of state that are um, not always, there, there are a few different, you know, you know, people that came into power um, and became president that were uh, darker skinned, but mostly it was like a lot of the mixed race that were, that, that were trying to run the country. Uh, what's your take on that, Dave? Yeah, I was going to add that historically um, in the 19th century, for most of it, there is a um, something called politique de doublure that was practiced, and that you had a lot of the economic elite, which of course were descendants of the Europeans, so they were mulattoes or some of them even um, white foreigners who came to Haiti from, um, from Germany, Italy, France, etc., who, who really um, had a majority of the country's wealth um, within their hands. And although they couldn't rise to lead the country as president, they would influence behind the scenes with their wealth, right? Right. And so for most of the um, 19th century, um, you had that happening. You had a lot of black leaders who were being um, influenced by uh, the economic elite um, who were mainly mulatto and, um, and Europeans. And then what would ha what happened during the U.S. occupation is that uh, because uh, the U.S., um, you know, a lot of the Marines were... Southerners were racist. Um, they preferred the um, the mulatto Haitians, and so you'll notice that during the U.S. occupation from 1915 to 1934, you'll have some of the um, lighter-skinned presidents we've ever had um, in Haiti's history. And it's not by accident; it's because 
um, the U.S. government felt more comfortable uh, working uh, with these people who uh, they perceive to be superior to the darker skinned Asians. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, but that, that's, as with anything, that's not across the board, right? Mm -hmm. So like, like you see, uh, like Shawmine Peral, you know, he wasn't, he was a light skinned person, but mm -hmm. of course, you know, he led the biggest resistance against the U.S. So, it, you know, it, it goes like that sometimes. Yeah. All right, let's see, he looks mixed too. Uh, did anyone catch the name of the road building initiative? That was the Corvée system, C-O-R-V-E-E, -E, Corvée. Um, was like a policy, it was like a draconian pol um, uh, law that required uh, residents in that area to, you know, con do jobs like road building and construction yeah. in their districts and that the U.S. Uh, military used against the population, the, the rural population at the time. Yeah, and the COVID were known for the brutal working conditions and the harsh labor, right? And for that reason, that word is still um, part of the Haitian psyche um, because of how uh, terrible the conditions were for the Haitians who were involved in that system. And so to this day in Haiti and Haitian Creole, um, when someone wants to say that uh, you've made them work extremely hard for nothing, um, you know, for useless but tiring work. They call they use the word uh, "cold feet" to describe that. Yeah, I'm gonna start using that. <laughs> I'm gonna start using that. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, hey, you can have a broader understanding of colorism. Yeah, like Nazis, pretty much. Uh, so true. The visit Haiti. Yeah, the vocational training is good in theory, but horrible in execution. Training them to be servants by a teacher. Yep. Yeah, that whole, that, that was a big fumble. Um, I think that was an opportunity when, the, uh, when the, the United States started, you know, trying to focus on building schools and stuff like that. But the execution was just terrible. And, um, and it actually worked, <laughs> it worked against them. Have you ever heard of that school down there? Does that school still exist down there in in Haiti, the it, it is it, it actually is still in pretty good condition, and it's actually the um, it's the Department of um, Agriculture and um, Veterinary Medicine for the State University of Haiti. Oh, okay. So I, I pass by it quite often uh, when I'm going uh, to the north side of the country. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. And yeah, some the uh, to this day it's known as a school that um, that produces agronomists uh, in Haiti. Oh, I see. Nice. All right, cool. So are they, are they learning anything good or interesting? Okay, well, we went through that. Let's see, this is our school system. Now I also want to know right away, visit Haiti. Um, you want me to organize a trip to Haiti? Nah, man. I'm, uh, I got enough stuff on my plate. But I do know a lot of um, people that do trips to Haiti. So um, historical trips. And I saw someone asking about um Bellevue tours they do they mostly focus on historical trips uh, I went on a tour with them a few years ago uh to the north of Haiti and uh Cap Haitian and we did a lot of great historical things in fact I did a lot of research on that trip so yeah and also as I've mentioned I'm based here in Haiti and um I run a nonprofit organization basketball took with the youth and we always have volunteers who come down here to uh help us out so if anyone's interested uh definitely uh, try to arrange that, especially in July when we'll be celebrating our seventh anniversary. We will definitely have a number of different volunteers. So if anyone is interested, uh, definitely feel free to reach out to me and I'll write my email address in the chat here um, if you are interested in that. All right, cool. All right, I'm interested in that. I might have to come <laughs> for that. Uh, let's see. What? Trujillo had a Haitian mom? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, Trujillo was so um crazy you know talking about colorism i mean he used to powder his face he used to try to make himself look white um like whiter than white <laughs> you know what i mean like he had a serious complex and um you know that whole parsley massacre thing i mean that just tells you what type of person that he is um yeah but uh, yeah it's reported widely reported i read i read about it all the time that his his mom was haitian so let's see. 
that was racist. Don't forget that part. Did Trujillo have any Haitian relatives? I don't really know too much about Trujillo. I didn't read. The only part I like really read in history about him is that part um, dealing with Haiti. So, I mean, you know, just a narcissist dictator. Uh, yeah, right, because Trujillo was a vehement about whitewashing his appearance. Yep. Yeah, and birth records, that's right. Yeah, he sure was. Let's see, how could anyone support your heel? Yeah, I agree. I loved, agreed. Thanks for great info. What was the name of the road building initiative? Curl Corvée. Looked up Bellevue Tours. We already talked about that. Bellevue is running a folk dance tour with Riva from Tutsi Pa. This collaboration offers the arts and history execution. Yeah, yeah, Bellevue. Um, I love them. I love their organizers, Gerline and Olga, close friends of mine, and they do great work. I see. Thanks. Where did you see that? Not on their website. Okay. Yeah, they have some information. Do you think IET will ever get its gold back? No, I doubt it. You know, I think the gold is actually still there. <laughs> it's gold, you know. Um, it's in New York somewhere, like at Fort Knox or one of these places where they keep the gold reserves. But no, I mean, why would they give Haiti's gold back? I mean, the United States is a bunch of big bullies and they just do what they please because they have the biggest army. So, you know, it is, it is what it is, but they, I mean, it's well known that they robbed it. It's not theirs. They stole it from another country. I mean, it's crazy. And, and their debt was completely paid back to the United States, by the way. And um, they still don't have their gold back, so. All right, let's see. Uh, okay, thanks. White Fragility at its best. There's a book called Citizen Toussaint. Yeah, I read that. Uh, and Black Jacobins, of course. Uh, that goes deeper into issues between mulattoes. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen a lot of comments about colorism, and those are a few sources. Uh, thank you for the webinar, by the way. Yep. And there goes Dave's email. Okay, this was very interesting. My great grandparents and grandparents were a part of this era. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, a lot of uh, my grandparents were a part of that era as well. And uh, I can only imagine, you know, in fact, um, Edward Danticat wrote a book about um, the Parsley Massacre. I forget the name of it. Um, I know it's in my library, but. Uh, yeah, uh, The Farming of Bones. Yeah, The Farming of Bones, yeah. Yeah, so she, she goes into uh, a lot of detail uh, of that era as well yep forming of bones all right so i think that's i think that's it for the questions and of course this uh webinar is sponsored by thoroughbred books which is pretty much my publishing company uh you know i published four books on haitian history so far you know haiti the first black republic Makandal, the black messiah bookman and cecile fatima black revolution and um, of course, a book written by Bayina Bello, She Rose of the Haitian Revolution. So if you're interested in any of this stuff, you know, definitely check out my website, www.thoroughbredbooks.com and um, support, I appreciate that. And also, uh, Dave has some great initiatives going on. So talk about that a little bit, Dave. Yeah, uh, so as I've mentioned, I run the nonprofit organization, uh, Basketball to Look to Youth that uses uh, basketball as a tool to mentor and educate youth. And two of Port-au-Prince's uh, toughest neighborhoods, multi sense de Soleil, who've been doing this work um, since July 2013. Um, in addition to that, um, I run my own um, production company that does multimedia projects as a way to um, influence Haitians positively here in Haiti and also to change the Haiti narrative globally. So I've um, shared my email address already, so if you guys have any questions, would like to volunteer or uh, coming down to Haiti, uh, definitely don't hesitate to reach out to me. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, guys, so we're almost at the end. We have one more session left on Friday. So uh, make sure you join us tomorrow, same time. We're going to get into the dictatorship and democracy. And actually, tomorrow, Dave um, actually did a, a, a documentary um, on Haitian history that actually touches on uh, the dictatorship. So we're going to view some of that documentary tomorrow and then we're going to get into that discussion. So I'm looking forward to that. 
So definitely join us tomorrow. And I think that's it, everybody. So hope you guys enjoyed this session of uh, you know the U.S. occupation. Hopefully, you guys learned something. Um, you know, and you know that's what we're here to do. We're here to share information, uh, talk about it, and you know learn something that we didn't know before. So that's going to be the end of this session. Make sure to join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. And uh, I look forward to it. Hey, Dave, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate your help. My pleasure, brother. All right, fantastic. All right, everybody. So take care, be safe out there. And of course, wash your hands. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, All right peace. peace. See y'all later. Mm-hmm.